So topics for today, why are we talking about carbon farming? What is carbon farming? Is carbon farming right for your business? What carbon farming project um, method is available for your farm operations? And then the resources to help, both what we can help and external help. So um, there's all our topics to today. If at any point after the end of each of those subsections you've got a question, just put up your hand, raise, type it, call out, whatever. Pretty informal. So here is that pre-workshop questionnaire. For someone, if you didn't um, get the questionnaire up the link, you can take a picture of the QR code, and that's what it looks like on the um, the right hand side of the screen when it when it comes up. And within embedded in the pre-workshop um, questionnaire is actually the link as well. If you haven't managed to get it done, you can go to it afterwards when Kate sends out the links. Okay, so why are we talking about carbon farming? I've actually been asked this a, a fair bit. I think most of you who have come here are pretty um, clued up, otherwise you wouldn't be here. But a history, the history of this is in 1992, the United Nations established the Framework Convention on Climate Change, and that was as a um, response to some time, scientific work, uh, research that showed that um, global temperatures were rising and they believed, the scientists believed there was an anthropogenic, human-induced reason for that. And moving on from that, in 1997, we had the first Kyoto Protocol, which was the first international agreement between, um, at that point, it was 132 signatories, which put targets down for what they were going to reduce their emissions um, by against 1990 um, emissions at that point. Now, Australia was a part signature to that, but one of the reasons why the oil mallet industry had, uh, faltered and one of the reasons why we didn't get some of the big projects up was we um, weren't a full signatory. Australia wasn't a full signatory to the Kyoto Protocol, which meant that we couldn't do what was called joint implementation. So we couldn't use um, external overseas company couldn't do their um, carbon sequestration projects with us because they couldn't claim the carbon credits. And if anyone was around with the oil mallies in the late 90s and early 2000s and through the 2000s, there was a bit of excitement up and down, up and down. And some of the, um, the reasons that it couldn't get up was there was no formal carbon agreement. That changed later. Um, and in 2015, we had the Paris Agreement, which Australia was a signatory to, but again, what's called an MAD, Australia had their agreement doctrine, I think, yeah, um, memorandum agreement document, and we didn't sign up to all of what the other international parties um, to that agreement. We had slightly less um, targets than everybody else, and we had a conservative government at the time. They had signed an, uh, to net zero by 2050, but had no interim targets and there was quite a number of exemptions. On the West Australian side, 19, uh, 2019, we had the WA Climate Policy, which was enacted in 2020. We at DPIRB Low Carbon Futures are here because of the climate, uh, West Australian Climate Policy. We are funded as a direct result of that climate policy, and that has a number of actions that the WA government is committed to um, in terms of managing climate change. You may have heard of SERS, which is sec um, Sectorial Emissions Reduction uh, Schemes, and there's a lot of talk about that within all of the uh, various sectors with um, mining, agriculture currently, and there's a fair bit of funding available within SERS to try and abate and reduce emissions. Last year, we had a change of government, and the new government fairly quickly um, at the latest uh, COP, that COP meeting last year, which is um, a conference of parties who are signatories to Paris, um, increased our Paris Agreement commitments. So Australia now is committed to reducing our emissions by 2030 um, to 43 per cent and 2050 is our target for net zero. Now, whether you are a climate believer or not, it doesn't really matter. Australia's made this commitment and we've got international agreements in place now that are attempting to limit our global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees. 
the Australian government and the West Australian government, but all government agencies have signed on um, extra obligations. The federal government has signed that all federal government departments, except for the Antarctic Division and the Defence Force, will be net zero by 2030. And the state government has made that um, commitment to be 80% of net uh, zero by 2030 for all government departments also. So there's some regulatory um, impetus there for these changes. So that's a bit of a quick history. Now, who are the key players in carbon farming um, in terms of regulatory bodies? The one at the top, the Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water, the biggest department name ever in the history of departments. Tanya uh, Plibersek is the federal government minister responsible for that. And within that department, they have the Emissions Reduction Fund, the ERF, and the Clean Energy Re Regulator, the CER, and they also have Climate Active. They're all bodies that are regulatory bodies that sit under the DCC EEW. And then we also have a recently established Net Zero Authority, which is Prime Minister and Cabinet. And their oversight is to look at all Net Zero um, state, federal bodies, and how they can coordinate the um, federal government's goal for net zero by 2050. Significant money has been um, put to that organisation. And then we have our WA departments. You've got the Department of Climate, Industry and Regional De uh, Development, which is us. You've got the Department um, of Land and Heritage. You've got the DBCA, um, Parks, Land, and you've got Parks, Wildlife, Conservation, I always get up. Jitsi, there's many of them. But DPIRB, DPLH, DBCA and EPA are the ones that are doing most of the coordination and conversations around um, the net zero targets and carbon farming. You, The uh, Premier recently came out and made an announcement regarding carbon, farm, carbon farming and he's asked for a full briefing um, from the uh, Agriculture Minister on what WA is doing in terms of carbon farming. So we've got a pretty big impetus, as I said. So some of the jargon, emissions calculations, carbon neutral, net zero, carbon farming, insetting, offsetting, carbon sequestration. My aim today is that you'll, by the end of this, you'll understand what most of those terms are, or all of those, hopefully. That's my goal, that hopefully we can get you to the point where you go, oh, I understand what um, that means. Now, this is a graphic that if you were look, looking at your whole business, your whole farm business and what um, the sectors that your business might be involved in, in terms of your carbon emissions and carbon sequestration, carbon farming potential, these four quadrants um, summarise it fairly well. Up on the top right hand side, what I'm talking about mostly today is carbon farming ACUs, oh, that was a, I forgot to put the ACUs in as a jargon. That's the Australian Carbon Credit Unit, um, which is equivalent to one tonne of CO2 equivalent. And that's offsetting. So when you offset something, you look talking about carbon farming. Underneath, I mentioned Climate Active, that they're the insetting verification um, body within the federal government department. And that is getting your emissions um, an understanding of your emissions and potentially using any sequestration to inset or abate your own emissions and get your own car, um, emissions calculations um, within your organisation. So they're slightly different. Insetting, you don't trade. Carbon farming potentially is a tradable product with ACUs. Over on the left-hand side, which is something that left-hand top quadrant, we talk about biofuel, biomass, biochar. Anyone who um, has been up around Kalani, you've got the bio, uh, you've got Kochi oil, and then you've also got Rainbow Beater. And there's a couple of other players who, if we had more time, we may have asked to present who are currently in the West Australian arena, encouraging farmers to be involved in bioenergy and biomass. There's a big push for biodiesel in WA and also um, SAP, which is um, sustainable aviation fuel. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end. 
And then down the bottom left-hand quadrant is our natural capital accounting. And this is essentially a, accounting for what is existing on your farm in terms of remnant veg. Potentially, um, there could be uh, markets for that coming up with the new um, Nature-Based Biodiversity Act, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But emissions reduction, growing farm and profitability, that tagline, all of those things um, come into this circle and they're all interactive. I'll mainly be talking about the carbon farming side with a little bit of um, dabbling with the other three quadrants as I go along. So what is carbon farming? And essentially this is a pretty simple um, definition. Carbon farming refers to land-based activities that sequester or store carbon in vegetation and soil. Now that soon might change to land and water-based activities. But from a farming point of view, um, unless you've got a massive, massive, massive area of water, you're going to be based mainly in the non-aquatic zone, but there are things called blue carbon, um, where there is the sequestration potential of fresh water and salt water to fix and lock carbon as well. But in terms of the West Australian Land Division and our wheat belt zone, we're mainly concerned with uh, land-based activities. So sequestering is just a fancy name for sucking greenhouse gases and storing it, basically, and that's either in the soil or vegetation. Any questions on that? Nope, okay. So is carbon farming right for your business? We talk about this in terms of Generating ACUs or carbon credits is the cherry on the top. We look at diversified income, potential for farm benefits, co-benefits of improved soil, reduced wind erosion, improved yields. There's plenty of research now that we've got um, that has shown that carbon farming, um, tree vegetation carbon farming has some pretty positive impacts on yields um, in some locations whole ecosystem health, regeneration of degraded land, mitigate salinity, increase your biodiversity. Now this one on the right, understanding your system, manage your land more efficiently by measuring the natural resource constraints. One of the interesting things in the first eight weeks that I've come across in um, having some meetings with some of our biggest service providers is in going through some of these processes with their clients, these are agronomy businesses, and looking at carbon farming, it was the first time that many of those farm operations had looked at their whole system and understanding the whole of their farming operation, not just that I can put wheat or canola in this crop and this is my um, fertilising regime and this is my um, spraying regime and this is what my expected harvest might be. They're looking at how water, the whole water management, soil carbon management, ecosystem management with corridors connecting. And I found that really interesting that this carbon farming project impetus that allowed farmers to get a better understanding. Then on top of that, there is the potential, which I'll talk about, to generate um, diversified income revenue through getting Australian carbon credit units. So you go, yep, one of those, two of those, three of those previous slides, I'm interested. Those things are all something I want. Let's have a look. I want to do a carbon farming project. So what's the best method? Now, this is where it can be confusing for people who go to the Clean Energy Regulator website um, with all the options that are available. And I'm going to try and break those down into a pretty simple understanding. So, but before you even consider that, there are a number of eligibility requirements that every single project has to have. And the first one is that has to be new. It cannot have been implemented before you register your project with the Clean Energy Regulator. It can't be something that you were doing previously. So it has to have a newness element. You can't have, it has to be, um, meet the additional, additionality requirement. You can't be required to do it under a previous existing legal requirement. And an example of that is some farms have soil covenants on them that they've registered um, with the Soil Commissioner um, 
and which currently we're working through some of those because there's already a legal requirement for those farms to protect and maintain their soil. It doesn't mean that it can't be overcome, but if there's already a legal requirement for you to do that project, then you fail the additionality um, requirement and you can't do the project. There's not too many carbon farming projects that will have that as an issue, but there might be some, and that's something you need to be aware of. You have to have the legal right, so that means you need to be the owner of the property in which you're going to do the carbon farming on, or your lease of that area is greater than the length of the project. And I'll talk more about that in the in a minute. Sorry, I went back. Oh, I went jump one. Oh, yeah, no legal right. And you have to be a fit and proper person. So that's in terms of um, are you able to hold a, di a directorship of the company, all of those ASIC requirements um, for being a fit and proper person. This is an interesting one that there's been quite a bit of discussion about. Any eligible interest holder must give their consent. So the, the main one of those is your mortgage holder. Anyone that is, anyone who um, has an interest on your title, you must gain their interest um, holder consent. And there are easy forms available within the CER for you to do this, but you've got to be aware. And some of the seminars that I've been to regarding uh, this the banks are just say, come and talk to us. As soon as you think you might be going to um, do a carbon farming project, come and have a discussion with us so we can work it through. This one sometimes scares people. There is a permanence requirement for all projects and you have to sign up to 25 years or 100 years. So that means you need to maintain whatever the carbon project is for 25 or 100 years. Now, depending on whether you choose 25 or 100, the sequestration rates that we will talk about that ca are calculated with the calculators get discounted by 25% or 5% respectively. And it's really important to note that the permanence timeline starts from the first accounting report, not from the registration of the project. And I'll talk a little bit about that when I'm talking about what potential costs are involved in doing a carbon farming project, but you need to put in reports and audit, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So they're all of those eligibility requirements, regardless, they're not specific to the projects. Anyone got any questions on um, the eligibility requirements? Just speak up, unmute and speak up if you do. No, all good? Okay. So, there are specific eligibility crime uh, requirements for a chosen method. There are two basic options. You've got soil and or vegetation, carbon sequestration, carbon farming options, and I'm going to run through what they are now. So soil organic carbon sequestration uses a measurement and model method. And Essentially, the basic of the soil organic carbon is you're looking at accounting for your soil organic at the start, organic carbon at the start of the project and the end of the project, and what the difference is. And those that difference is what you can claim as um, an a carbon uh, Australian carbon credit unit. The key thing about soil carbon projects, they must be an eligible activity. And that eligible activity has to be a change from business as usual. It can't be something that you're going to do. It has to be a change that you're doing to your um, business as usual management practice. So that might mean you go from min till to no till. It might mean that you go from um, having two um, perennial pastures to 10 perennial pastures with a mix of deep-rooted perennial pastures. It might mean that you change um, you change the type of perennial that you're using. And the, the detailed guidance document on the um, Clean Energy Regulator has what those eligible activities are. And there's the fact sheet on the left-hand side, and they are both hyperlinked for you to look at later. The key other element for a soil carbon project um, is that you must have a land management strategy. So the land management strategy is a detailed document that um, puts out what your carbon estimation area is. It explains what your soil organic carbon potential is and um, identifies how much you will sequester. 
It also, you have to account for the emissions in undertaking the project. So what are the livestock emissions, fertiliser application, line application, residue, tillage events, all of those things need to be accounted for under the project and they're put um, in a land management strategy. I'll talk a little bit about how we can help with that later, but that is an absolute requirement and is a cost, which I'll talk about later too. So you can see down the bottom, there is a picture of uh, highlighted areas. That's from Luxi, and that is the um, a example of carbon es um, estimation area for a particular project. And then there's some resource management from a GIS program on the right, which is how they would potentially map um, your carbon estimation area and therefore work out what your sequestration rates would be. Most soil organic carbons require actual ground truthing, physical um, soil samples, and they need to be tested regularly. So there is a, a, an expense that goes with a soil organic carbon um, project. Any questions on soil organic carbon? No, all good. So we then have vegetation projects and we have two types of agroforestry projects. We have the new plantation method or the farm forestry method, and they have some slight differences, but essentially those two methods can be a harvesting system, but they you have to establish a new plantation forest. Um, it has to integrate into your farming system and it can be a farming system. Now, I don't want to confuse people, but under the pl a new plantation forestry method, there is, one mechanism that allows you to take existing trees that you've got on your property and convert them to a CER project. But there are a few um, requirements and ultimately you need to get some legal advice regarding that. But essentially, if you're going to rip your trees out and you go, well, I won't if you let me convert them to a CER project, then there is potential for existing trees to be converted to a, um, a plantation forestry method. The issue with uh, established trees, There's, depending on their age, there's not a lot of carbon sequestration potential left, so you may not be able to generate that any accues anyway. The other thing is the land has to be cleared of any plantation or native forest for seven years prior. Now, new plantation forestry method requires a forest management plan, and it also all forestry, all plantation methods require you to talk about how you are going to mitigate the risk of fire and um, prevent um, a reversal event occurring. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be in a forest management plan, but within your application, you'll be required to talk about how you are going to mitigate the risk of fire and any carbon reversal. And again, same with all of them, 25 to 100 years. Now, you also notice some shires have limits on planting areas, that there's only a certain percentage of the farm can be planted. The farm forestry method also has a limit on the total percentage of your farm up to a 300 hectare limit that it allows you to plant under the farm forestry method too. So there are some requirements for both of those. They're not insurmountable and the benefits can uh, generally in the projects that are up and are working at the moment outweigh the costs. The one that is going to be of most interest to um, wheat belt farmers is reforestation by environmental or mallee planting, or in a small project, an environmental planting pilot method. Under those methods, um, it has to be a native species. Um, there is a species list that you have to choose from. It can be eucalypt mallees under 600 mils of rain, and it has to be in linear or block plantings. The other eligibility for this compared to the agroforestry, it has to be cleared of forests for five years or more. Um, so if it hasn't been cleared of forest in the previous five years, you can't do this project. Again, mitigate, you need to talk about how you're going to mitigate the risk of fire and reversal of carbon stocks and 25 or 100 year permanence needs to be chosen. In terms of the environmental pilot planting, the difference between the reforestation by environmental malleal planting method is it's got a limit of 200 hectares or less. 
But why the, um, the Clean Energy Regulator has brought this one uh, in as a pilot is that they don't require you to do the audit for your accounting, which I'll, again, I'll talk about that when I'm, I'm talking about the cost. But uh, the audit is quite an extensive thing and the environmental planting um, uh, pilot planting method doesn't require you to do the audit. The Clean Energy Regulator will do that remotely. And so that's a, a significant cost saving, but it has to be 200 hectares or less. And you really need to have a reasonable potential for carbon sequestration for that to be worthwhile. I'll talk a little bit more about that when it comes to the costings. So potentially early 2024, well, it's not potential, it's going to happen, but we're just not sure of what the actual procedures are going to be, but um, the Clean Energy Regulator has put out for comment and they're working through a process, what they're calling the integrated farm management method, or think about it as stacking. So that means you can have all of those projects that I've just talked about within the one project. So you could have soil, you could have agroforestry, you could have um, environmental plantings, and all of those can be registered under the one project. And the idea of that is save some of the compliance and auditing and um, accounting costs involved with your reporting obligations, which again, I'll talk about a little bit later. So that's coming early 2024. We're, we're not exactly sure when, but um, watch this space and we will keep people posted because a lot of farmers who are getting ready to do projects have asked, when's the stacking method coming? So, and that's just a graphic of what you can do with the stacking method. I forgot I had that graphic. Okay, so question was asked about how we estimate our um, carbon potential and the ACUs that we generate. There are two um, government approved accounting methods. So we have full CAN, which is the full carbon accounting model, and that's for our energy, um, our emissions reduction fund vegetation projects. And the link is there. And essentially full CAN, you go on to full CAN, you can map your property and it'll give you a carbon estimate for whatever project type that you chose. Luxi um, is has been developed by the CSIRO and that allows you to go and get a general, it's a 10 by 10 kilometre soil carbon estimator. So it's not as accurate, but it allows you to estimate any soil carbon potential on your farm. Now, both of these tools being developed by government departments are not very user friendly. And when I was asked about the accounting tools um, that are available and to talk about the one that I recommend um, for you a bit later, but there are much more user-friendly tools that are available that incorporate the full CAM model um, in the background. So you're compliant with your CER um, accounting, uh, carbon accounting requirements, but much easier to use. So those two are where you get your information for the potential estimate of your carbon sequestration. And the links are within the, the slides you can go to those. But I think Unless you're a actual full bottle on sequestration models and love a good model, you're not going to find them very easy to use. So the next step, you choose one of those projects. You go, okay, I'm going to do an environmental planting pilot project, or I'm going to do an agroforestry project. Yeah, that thing, I think that suits my business. The first thing you need to consider are the costs involved. So there are planning and establishment costs, and that could be, include getting uh, agronomist, ecological advice. Um, you might need to prepare a land management strategy or a carbon farming plan. You might need to um, get uh, costs for revegetation um, site establishment. There's any, most of you all would imagine have done some sort of tree planting um, in the past and you understand most of the dynamics that are involved in that cost. The added costs here are the preparation of the land management strategy and then point to the ongoing project and compliance maintenance and reporting and auditing. You're required to do a report of your carbon sequestration a minimum of every five years. So in a 25 year project, that is five reports, including your first baseline. 
And then the auditing requirements is a minimum of every seven years. You have to put in an audit report every seven years, and they are costly, and I'll talk about that in a minute. The only exception to that is the environmental um, pilot, uh, plant, uh, planting pilot. You have to consider the, the cost of your time if you're going to run this project. And what is the opportunity cost if you um, are changing your system to be a new production system? Consider those. And that there are tools out there that can give you those cost benefit analysis. And I'll talk about those when I talk, talk about info to help. But the compliance, maintenance, reporting and auditing are significant costs that you would not have had previously in any um, planting or uh, project that you've done in the past. So here's an example. This is a, an example from a tool called Carbon Scout, and I'll talk about that a bit more. And these are industry standard. This is a 300 hectare agroforestry. Don't copy these down. These are just example. You really need to understand your own property, but tree planting costs, direct seedling, $650 per hectare. The service setup fees, that's registration with the clean energy regulator, getting your account with the clean energy regulator, design planning, the project, um, on-site inspection project, about $23,000 was the estimate for this. Now that'll be up and down depending. First offset report, subsequent offset report, a forestry site inspection report, because this was an agroforestry project, and the orders over the life, the 25 year life of this project, there's $353,000 in compliance costs. And I go, oh my God, it's not, I'm not going to do it because the potential benefit, I, I didn't put up the revenue generated, but the, the net present value revenue generated from this example was $950,000 over the life of the project. But you need to consider that there are significant costs in establishing and reporting and auditing these clean energy regulator karma farming projects. Quite, people quite often have questions about that. Anyone got a question about reporting, maintenance reports, audit reports, LMSs? No? Okay. So consider the potential re revenue then. We've used the carbon estimation tool, whether it's FullCam or LookSee or one of the uh, other ones that are available. We can then estimate our revenue based on what the ACUs are. Australian Carbon Credit Unit, one tonne of CO2 equivalent abated is one ACU. Now, obviously, the direct revenue from participating in the ERF depends on how many carbon credits you generate, and that will depend on the price also. So this is the carbon um, Australian Carbon um, ACU market, and I actually haven't put the latest one. We had a bit of a, a price drop um, down to, we actually got down to $18 two weeks ago, but it's back up in the 20s now when we had the issuance of all close to a million ACUs for some soil carbon projects um, in Queensland. The bottom one is a estimate of what the carbon, uh, the ACU price will be in Australia. The blue is the mean, the green dotted line is the high um, case, and the red dotted line is the low case scenario for what the price of an ACU will be in Australia. I'll talk about the mechanisms for selling those in a little bit as well. So there has been some volatility in the market, but it is re it's relatively stable. And all projections are that it will continue to grow. Um, you know, as a, a month a month ago, it was thirty five dollars, which was the start of that base figure. So you look at the costs, you look at the revenue, you look at the economics, you can go. Actually, the economics are right for me. So what do I do to plan my project? How do I get my project project off the ground? And we like this little graphic because there's lots of help out there for you. We've got the you do mainly do it yourself. So if you're really clued up, you've got a good understanding of your farming systems and you've got a pretty good capacity to make your way through the CEA, you might just do um, some hire for, hire for service to assist you in getting your um, permanence plan organised or if you're doing an LMS for soil carbon. But you get the biggest bite of the cake you essentially get all of the cake for the potential revenue generated from your ACUs. 
The other one is you have a project service provider, and that means that you get a lot of the cake, but there's a bite of the cake, a piece of the cake's taken out for the service provider providing advice for you. And that comes under a number of different models and different service providers out there have different models, but that could be that they take five to 50% of your project um, revenue generated to, and, and, but they take on the project costs. Um, agreed percentage of the accus. It could be that you just pay them a certain amount per year. Um, Kate's just put into the, the our LRP resources uh, into the chat. Those links will be um, later on. Also, the third option, so you've, you could do DYO with a bit of help. Project service provider does a lot of the help, but you're still getting a big piece of the cake you get a project aggregator or developer. And there are a couple of those in Western Australia. There's a, a, a company called Wheatbelt Connect, which is ANZ, Impex and Qantas, that are looking to plant Mallies in the Wheatbelt of Western Australia and go into some sort of sharing arrangement because they're looking to generate ACUs, then ultimately to generate biomass to feed into uh, biofuel um, and sustainable aviation fuel plants that they're planning to produce, and they're looking to get that up by 2030. So they're um, going around, um, and they've been attending some of our workshops um, with their proposal, and they take more pieces of the pie. But you still get, you might get a much smaller piece of the pie, and it could be that you go, they'll pay you an annuity, or they'll go, we'll, we'll um, give you some of the ACU, some annuity, or they do a... Um, Accu share it depend and now those things are, de are developed on a case by case basis. So they're the three models that you've got for planning. In registering your project at the uh, um, with the emissions reduction fund, so the current you have to sign up for an account, and currently that wait time is quite long. That's two to three months. You then have to register your project once you've got your account 12 weeks before you begin doing anything. And then you have to provide the forward abatement estimate of your ACUs generated over the 25 years. Now, if you choose 100 years, you have to provide that too. But it's also interesting, you also need to understand that the ACUs are paid over 25 years. It's not that you get ACUs at year 30, 40 or 50. The ACU, you just have to maintain the permanence of whatever carbon sequestration that you've got in um, in either soil or reveg for the extra 75 years. All of the ACU that are paid by the clean energy regulator or registered by the clean energy regulator is a better term. Um, happen in the first 25 years. So you need a forest management plan for the new plantation forestry method. You need a land management plan for the uh, strategy for the soil. And you must report every five years and audit every seven and you have to nominate um, your permanence obligation. Now, there are three current methods of um, what to do with your, your carbon credit, your ACU. You can, there is the ability to enter into an agreement with the government for a set price. You can go to the auction open market um, and essentially put your uh, carbon acnes up and there's a bidding process, or you can hold them. What's been currently developed is an actual market similar to the stock exchange where you'll be trading acnes, um in a live market. And, but that is currently under development, and there was a review, that, um, and that by uh, Chubb, which did an independent review of that, and said we need to separate our carbon ACU market from our actual regulator, and that's where they're in the process of developing this market outside of government, if you like. So what are the resources to help? So depending on where you are, what is carbon farming? If you're here in that first part, coming to a seminar like this or a workshop like this, you need to get a bit more information. You need to get an understanding of what the CR regulations are. Um, I suggest that you go to the Carbon Farming Foundation. It is, it is one of the simplest um, wordings of all of the CER documents that you'll find. We all use it within DPIRB. Our newbies, I sent them 
to the Carbon Farming Foundation website. They're in the process of separating their education extension from the Carbon Farming Foundation, which is a financial service provider, so that their, their extension and education stuff is independent. DPIRB, we've got a lot of resources. We've got our key steps document and we've got a lot of resources and a lot of links to um, the carbon um, service providers. We've got um, links to the CER. All of those links are available through our website, which you can access through that link. If you need to undertake an emissions calculation, Carbon Active, and you're mostly going to need to uh, approach a WA service provider. DPIRB can help, but it's not really currently in our wheelhouse. Um, and you most probably need, before you do a carbon farming plan um, or a carbon farming project, get an understanding or at least be doing them in parallel so that you've got an understanding of what your farm emissions are. Um, we do have some further information of that, but given the time constraints of today, um, I didn't want to um, go into emissions calculations, but there are um, calculators out there that can help you um, with your emissions calculations. So if you want to, I want to sequester carbon for my own emissions balance, then that's what we've been talking about till today. And I want to generate ACUs, that's what I've been talking about today. Um, if you can't sequester, what options do you have? And again, there's some, um, the market advisory group has got some options if you need to go in and buy ACUs or potentially you can go and um, co-aggregate projects with other um, farmers, but there are other options. And then I planted trees, what can I do with them? This is the climate active in setting. If your trees are still sequestering carbon, you can, at the start of the year, inset, um, at the end of the year, you can inset what they've sequestered over the previous year and you can continue to do that. There are some, um, it's current obligations for that, but we don't know what that looks like in terms of what reports you have to do. And then you're ready to sell ACUs, you've got your CER and your third party credit schemes and private market. If you want to do something independent of the CER, there are international markets available and there are a couple of aggregators that um, in the West Australian um, market that are doing carbon farming projects and they're selling the ACUs generated to international markets. And, and that could be something that you want to uh, go down as well. So sequestration planning tools. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but there's a number of soil planning um, uh, assessment tools. You've got Soil um, Health app, you've got the Soil Carbon Research Program SCARP app. Um, you've got our own DPIRB um, fact sheet and um, an analysis fact sheet. So there are, then you've got Look C as well, which has the carbon sequestration. You can go and have a look at all of those. Soil Health is a free app, and that's actually a pretty good um, one to go out on your farm, and it'll give you a pretty good idea um, of what your soil carbon health and what your soil carbon might be under a standard farming regime. Um, in terms of agroforestry, one of the best tools is the Southwest Timber Hub. It is for the higher rainfall areas of WA, but it's got a decision tree um, calculator and it can be useful just to have a look at what's available. We've also got, there's the Clean Energy Regulator website. The Carbon Market Institute is something that they're the carbon industry, code, hold the carbon industry code of conduct. So if you engage a carbon um, service provider, you most probably want to make sure that they're a signatory to the Australian Carbon Industry Code of Conduct. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what offerings we have that you might be able to uh, access a service provided for. DPIRB, and there's the Carbon um, Farming uh, Foundation, they've got webinars available. So the Carbon Farming Foundation uh, tomorrow has got a webinar on um, the le uh, legal implications of a carbon farming project, um, and that might be worth going and, and having a look at. Uh, you know, in terms of succession planning, if you've got multiple properties um, with different um, corporate structure, those in, that information um, is quite valuable and also needs to, you need to get a handle of that. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we can help you with that too. So 
people that are there, you've got your NRMs, you've got your uh, grower group associations, you've obviously got um, women in farming who have put this on and there are other um, industry bodies. I've spoke about the Clean Energy Regulator, the Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water, and the EFR, which is part of um, that very mouthful department where you register. And there's a portal. Now, the other thing that you can do is on the EFR register, you can look to see what all of the current registered projects are in your area. So that portal link that we've got there on the, um, the page, that will take you to... Um, a general and a general tab, and then you can type in your area, and it will tell you eligible area, Southworth Land Division, and it will then put little dots on the map, and you can see anyone in your area that may have registered or has registered a C a clean energy regulator project, and then you might be able to go if you know them, you can go, oh, let's go and have a conversation, or there might be um, a land care or NRM meeting, or we might be coming out and they might be going to that meeting, or you can contact them. Just gives you that little bit of information about what's going on in your area. Uh, you know, sticking sticking your nose over the fence, but doing it online. So we have a provider list now. This provider list is on our website, and that's what it looks like. We put a disclosure. We don't vet these providers. We just put them in um, categories. So carbon project developers, consultants, ecologists, nursery, financial advisors, agronomists, and legal. Um, and we're, we're constantly adding and updating that. And so if you've got no idea, um, you haven't your agron ag agronomy agronomic advisor, I'll get that out in a second, if they're not a carbon service provider, like Plan Farm, for instance, have TerraWise as their carbon service provider. Um, if if you don't have a clue, then you can come to this service provider uh, worksheet. Co-benefits are worthy of um, looking at, and there's a co-benefit portal that we have, which is really interesting. So you can go to the online tool and just have a look what co-benefits might be generated from doing a carbon farming project on your website and get some idea of whether it's going to be whole system beneficial for you to do a carbon farming project. And these are those online tools. So there's look, see, be. I'm just going to talk about that because look see B is the biodiversity calculator, and that gives you an understanding and idea of what could be the biodiversity benefits um, in your on your farm. Now, the one in the middle is Carbon Scout, and that's the one where I uh, generated those expenses from. Carbon Scout is an independent um, tool that you can use for a fee for service that allows you to get a report for your farm that will tell you what the carbon estimation area is, what the carbon potential of your farm is, what the costs, what's the revenue, what's the internal rate of return, what are the discounted um, revenue projections. Really, really, really useful tool. That is $900. Um, the cool farm tool is not bad, but it doesn't do the economic modeling. And again, there's the DPIRB resources. So we have two ways of um, helping farmers. We've got our Carbon Farmers Voucher Program. And this is a, um, a grant that we give to primary producers. Um, we are announcing early August the details of that, but essentially you can use this grant to get a feasibility study done. Um, the land co holder contribution there is actually 20% of the cost. That's an error, my mistake. It is actually now a co-contribution of 20%. And um, when this voucher program is announced, I suggest if you're looking at doing a pre a feasibility study on your farm, that you um, put in an application because it will give you a significant amount of money. I'm not allowed to tell you it was 10,000 last year. That's increasing for this year. I, I'm not allowed to tell you the amount, but it's a 20% co-contribution. And most of the reports that the carbon service providers are doing will be covered by um, our voucher grant and your co-contribution. And you can do it for, I want to know what carbon farming potential is, what are the legal implications of doing a carbon farm, 
what are the accounting implications of doing karma farming project on my farm in terms of my whole farm economics. Um, you can also look at the ecological co-benefits and incorporate that into a carbon farming plan. There are multiple options available. Um, myself and another one of my colleagues are um, in the midst of finalising the details of that. And again, they will be available early um, August. So watch that space if that's something you'd like to access because it's a government grant and the only obligation is your 20% co-contribution. Um, and engage, engaging a service provider to produce the report, the carbon farming plan, we're calling it. Okay, so the other option that we have is if you've done, a, if you're already at the point where you've done a carbon farming plan and you've on, you're further down that journey of that uh, table that I brought up before, we have the carbon farming land and restoration program. Now, this isn't a grant, this is a, um, effectively, it's a financial loan which gets paid back through ACUS generated and it's up to um, there's a 50 it's a 15 million dollar program and you can access up to 1.5 million dollars per project for the um, to help establish and maintain a carbon farming project on your site um, we have got a, an announcement coming up next week of the round two um, successful um, applicants of that, that carbon farming land restoration program. Um, it's a commitment under our WA climate policy. It's the reason why we exist. And again, there's a number of um, co-benefits that it targets, as well as generating um, ACUs, which then get held by the um, Rural um, Business Corporation, because as a state government, we can't hold those ACU. But it's a co-funding. You have to put in a co-contribution, but essentially um, the risk for that project in terms of the financial risk is taken on by um, this uh, funding body, which is, it is the RBDC. Um, now, we provide the up-up funding for in-kind um, repayments of ACUs. We're trying to build industry momentum. We're trying to get this industry up and running so that we can then ultimately as a government withdraw and it's self-perpetuating. Also share knowledge and improve capability so people can understand the pitfalls, what we've lessons learned, and just support innovative projects to contribute to climate resilience and agricultural productivity. It's a pretty um, substantial um, funding body, but in comparison, ours is $15 million, the Queensland equivalent, $500 million. So big difference, but we are trying um, you know, we're a few years behind that, but we've got this funding available. And the, all the information of that is available on our website too. So look for um, the round three announcement coming up later in the year, but also the round two uh, winners, because there might be some in your area. Now, just on the periphery, just to finish off, there's a nature repair market bill, which is a, essentially biodiversity credits. That's currently going through the... Um, Senate and the federal government, and this is potentially um, going to be administered, well, it looks like it's going to be administered this, by the CER and will be very similar to the way the Carbon Credits Act works, that there will be biodiversity certificates for maintaining and preserving biodiversity on your property, um, and it will likely work side by side um, in conjunction with um, a carbon farming uh, project as well. In terms of the United Nations Panel on Climate Change, um, they also have a United Nations Panel on Biodiversity Credits. And I recently spoke with a biodiversity expert in WA who was the keynote speaker at that, um, their equivalent of uh, the COP, the Convention of Parties for that. And essentially now the United Nations has drawn a line in the sand in that we cannot allow any further loss of biodiversity um, on Earth. And that, that is the impetus for this Nature Repair Market Bill, to try and um, prevent any further loss of biodiversity and encourage and pay people to protect the biodiversity that they have and hopefully to re-vegetate um, and re-establish biodiverse areas um, at, all over Australia. We have the link to the fact sheet and the link to the repair um, bill website there also. Okay. But watch this space. Got a question. Okay, question, sorry. 
Do us a group in Bolton Valley planting. Okay. Okay. So the, that is Wheat Belt Connect. So they're a, um, a joint venture between Impex, ANZ. Impex is a very large Japanese company um, who has gas uh, projects off the north coast of WA and uh, Qantas. And they're looking to generate ACUs, but their main goal is to be able to generate sustainable aviation fuel going into the future. So they're currently doing some pilot projects, uh, plantings um, in the North Wheatbelt area um, with their planning to have their first um, SAF project up by 2030. There's also another um, project that, while not Mallee's, that you might be interested in, in terms of biomass, which is Future Energy Australia, and they've been presenting in our workshops, and they're using um, farming residues, if you like, um, baled hay, and, and they're buying that off a, pro, um, a hay baling aggregate provider, and they're going to put that into a plant to produce biodiesel and also um, sustainable aviation fuel. They've got a site down in Narragin, and they're also in the future going to be looking at using Mallee plantings uh, in the wheat belt. But right now, they want to get their project up and running, and they, their technology allows them to use um, hay, essentially, which they pelletise and put through their pyrolysis process. Okay, any more questions? Come on. I couldn't have been that good. Do you think the ACH, what do you mean by ACH? Oh, sorry. Yeah, got it. Got it? Yeah, got it. I was waiting. Oh, yeah, ACH, sorry. Okay, look, there's been a bit of negative publicity um, regarding the ACH. I don't, I'm not really in a position to talk about the ACH. We are getting more information regarding that and how that will apply to tree planting. But what the minister came out with what happened on the weekend in terms of the tree planting um, in the Swan uh, Canning River catchment that got cancelled is that the ACH does not have the ability to stop a tree planting project. The minister came out and said that. So, look, watch this space. I think to be honest, I think there's a lot of misinformation. Essentially, the ACH is designed to stop things happening like having 50,000-year-old um, rock paintings blown up by huge mining companies, um, which was the impetus for the change in legislation. Ultimately, the legislation is really unchanged as to what it was before, except to capture those activities that are outside business as usual. So, you know, I've had some farmers go, oh, I'm going to have to, am I going to, have to get permission to put a, um, a new fence pole in? No. If it was something that you were previously doing and are continuing to do, then you do not need ACH permission to do it. But one of the – there needs to be, obviously, because every – Every workshop, we're getting questions about this. There has to be some more information provided, so, and and they're retro. They're actually doing that now. Rachel's got something to add. Go ahead. Just the last few days, they've added quite a lot of clear fact sheets to their website. Yeah. The um the planning land heritage or whatever they're called. Yeah. Um, which are quite clear. So like that fenced example is on there. So. There was a bit of a delay in that being um, uploaded to the website, but it is there now and it's very clear. Um, like like Andrew said, the intention is not to kind of punish farmers. It's really quite clear focusing on mining and big industry. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm presenting to the Rewa Rural um, Agents Con uh, Conference on Friday and the speaker at DPLH is doing an hour presentation at that conference beforehand. So they're now getting out and about. May have been better to potentially do that before they release the legislation. Um, but hopefully over the next few um, months, there will be a much clearer understanding and the concern, understandable concern that farmers are showing will be um, mitigated. Any other questions? Really, no questions. Yeah, I've got something, Andrew. Yeah. Um, 
I, I'm right at the beginning of the carbon farming um, journey. Yeah. So is there, sorry for people that already know the answer to this, but um, what do I need to, like I'll go look at that Carbon Farming Federation uh, Foundation website, but yeah. right now what do I need to do or what do we need to do? Good question. So, I mean, go. I, I'd recommend going to the CFF website. Come to DPIRB's website as well. CFF puts it in really, really basic terms. Two school teachers here. Year 10 level language is what you need to present this stuff at, basically. So there's enough detail that gives you the picture, but it's easily understandable. And the Carbon Farming Foundation does that. Rachel and I have had several conversations about our website, and we're going to move towards a bit more user-friendly website in the future as well. Get some base understanding. Is this Jen that asked that yeah. question? Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, the next point then is to potentially apply for a voucher. So because what that voucher can do is put you in contact with um, a number of different service providers that can then come to you and give you more information. But the more clued up you are before you go to the next step, the better the outcome will be. So the Carbon Farming Found, uh, Foundation insight, our website, um, Talk to, if you've got local um, NRMs, they might be able to provide some information. Jen, Jenny, where are you farming? Um, we're in Wagen. Wagen. So yeah. I think we did a workshop earlier in the year at Wagen. Um, we're coming, we, we do regional workshops as well, where we present a bit more of a detailed um, overview of what we've done, what we're doing now. But a bit of self uh, education at the start, and I thoroughly recommend that CFF website to do so. And then yeah. come and have a look at what um, our voucher program might offer to you. Also, if you've got your own agronomist, um, your specialist agronomist, have a chat to them because they yeah. might be able to point you in the direction for your local area, our service provider list. We're just in the process of updating that so it's got what regions they operate in. So you can go on to that and it'll say statewide, Great Southern, you know, South Coast, in and around Katanning or whatever it happens to be, just to make that a little bit more user-friendly. Um, but if you're right at that, that uh, initial journey, coming to a discussion like this is great. Um, and just doing some reading yourself um, is my advice. I had to get up to speed pretty quickly in the last or in my first four weeks because I've been out of the game for a little while. And it can be a little bit overwhelming going to the CER website. Um, it is very technical. So I recommend that you don't go anywhere near the CER website until you're almost ready to go, actually, I'm ready to do a carbon farming um, project now. Um, it will only confuse because of the language that they use. It. And you know what? <sighs> Unfortunately, with legal, they need to take their legal, li re re legal liability, reduce their risk, so they put it in, in a way that isn't necessarily as user-friendly as potentially could be. Our deeper website has got some really useful information. It's got key steps. There's a key steps document, key steps to establishing your carbon, a carbon farming plan on uh, a project on your property. And you could start with that as well. But essentially, the step one is to get yourself informed. Yeah, okay, thank you. Any Any other questions? I may as well ask. Yeah, well, go on. Sorry. Go on. Um, the, <laughs> the carbon credits. Yeah. How do, like, how do they work exactly? So if you get carbon credit, how, how does somebody buy carbon credits off you? Or like, okay. what do they do with it? So, well, there, there are, if you are a clean energy regulator registered project, that means you, before the project, you go through that process that I've talked about. And you may have come along a little bit later, did you, Jen? Oh, I have a baby, so he was right. just been no worries. Sorry, yes. No, no, that's <laughs> all right. So essentially when you register your project, you've got three options. You can enter into an agreement with the government and they will take your 
ACU. So a carbon credit is a ACCU, Australian Carbon Credit Unit, and that is equivalent to one tonne of CO2 equivalent. Okay. It's, it's so when you register your project and you go through all those reporting, at, at year five, you get your, uh, your ACUs get um, basically registered when you report, not when they're sequestered, but when you report. So at, at year five, you put in your first um, report and you've got 100,000 ACUs that you've generated. Now, there's yeah. three options. You may have already entered into agreement with the government for a set price. They pay you 100,000 times that set price if you want to sell them all. You could put it on the Emissions Reduction Fund um, bidding portal, which is going to change soon. But essentially, I, I, I want to sell 100,000. Here's a bid process. So people, external people register, and it's like an auction. I'll pay $25 for that. I'll pay 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, depending on demand and supply. Or you hold on to them. Yeah. You hold on to those carbon uh, credits. And potentially, um, initially, it's most of you worthwhile holding on to those ACUs until you um, under, have a really good understanding of what your total carbon footprint is. I didn't want to get too technical in this discussion, but you have to understand there are three effectively scopes of carbon emissions. You've got scope one, which is your business operation. So that's the, the emissions coming out of the back of your tractor as your seating, your header, um, the vehicles that you use on farm, the energy power that you use in your house and your, and your um, farm sheds, all of that. What are the emissions for that? That needs to be calculated. The second one is what is is the sorry is the power that comes in in terms of your um, southwest um, infrastructure power. So that's scope two, not the power that the house uses. That is scope two. That was my mistake. Sorry for the confusion. And then scope three is all of the inputs and ex, um, exports from your farm. So if you've got fertiliser coming onto your property, what is the carbon emission of that fertiliser getting to you? And if you transport fertiliser out, what is the fertile or uh, crop out, what is the emissions of um, that transport taking it to the CBH bin? Now, you don't have to worry about scope three at this moment, but you need to get a good understanding of your scope one and scope two. What are your farm emissions and what are your energy emissions? And then you can go, oh, well, I'm actually, um, my carbon um, footprint is my is net positive this, and I've got this many ACUs, so I'll keep those to offset my emissions, and then I'll sell them. But you need to have an understanding of that. Um, but that, or if you don't want to do a clean energy regulator project, there are, as, there are other project aggregators who will do a project with you, and they sell their carbon credits to international markets. Okay. Yeah. Yep. But, the, yeah, there are, so there are several options, but in Australia, the clean energy regulator is the is what most carbon um, projects are utilising. There are other, there are other mechanisms when the CER that are uh, available in terms of um, farming, but in terms of carbon farming, vegetation and soil are the ones that are available. There are, um, you know, different regimes for, you know, changing your, your stock feed that stops it burping as much, you know, stuff like that, um, that you might want to look at as well as a whole picture. But the focus of today was carbon farming. Yeah. Any okay. other questions? Yes. Yeah. Okay, one last request. So here's more information again. There's all those. I just put that as a, a, a um, summary at the end. I thoroughly recommend going to either our website or the CFF website to get your base information. And if I can then just ask you, um, Rachel's put it into the chat. If you want to click on that link or if you've got your phone and you're doing it on a computer, just to do your post-workshop questionnaire. Those of you who are um, listening to this in the recording online, 
I appreciate you taking the time um, to have a listen. Uh, if you could also just do the pre and post survey, we would really appreciate the information. Um, if Thank you for those of you who have attended. I hope you found it useful. Um, have my, happy to have anybody um, contact me um, through either um, DPIRB. Uh, Rachel, can you just put my website, uh, my uh, email address up on, oh, I don't have a website, I'm not that famous, <laughs> up on the, the site as well. Happy for you to directly um, contact me or through the Carbon Farming um, email. So carbon.farming at dperb.wa.gov.au, but I'm happy to answer questions directly as well, and then I'll just put them in the carbon farming box. Any last minute questions? No? Okay, Kate, I'll let you wrap it up. Thank you, everybody. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, yes, I'll be in touch to send out the PowerPoint and I'll be sending Roxanne um, a copy of the uh, presentation for you guys to play on your Women in Farming networks. So thank you very much for attending. Uh, I hope you got something out of it and I look forward to your questionnaire responses. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>